Hey YouTube, how's it going? Yak Science here with another OCHEM video. Today we're going to be talking about E2 or Elimination 2 reactions. Uh, if you haven't seen the E1 video, I recommend it. So when it comes to E2 and E1, you're going to see some similarities and some major differences. So let's just dive into it. Some things that happen in every E2 mechanism. Okay, number one, leaving group leaves. Leaving group <laughs> leaves. Another thing that happens, deprotonation of adjacent hydrogen. Okay, and don't worry if this kind of sounds like Greek to you. Um, we're going to go over a lot of examples and stuff like that. And the last thing that happens, uh, formation of carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, so these three things happen in elimination two. Notice some similarities to E1, right? Leaving group leaves, that happens in E1. Deprotonation of an adjacent hydrogen, that also happens in E1. And formation of a new carbon-carbon pi bond, that also happens in E1. But notice that I didn't include the formation of a carbocation. That happens in E1, but never in E2. That's one of many um, differences you'll see. So before I get into these, uh, Details of E2, I wanted to show you a quick example of a basic uh, E2 mechanism. So let's say we have this, this guy should look familiar to you. Okay. And let's say we react this with some sodium methoxide in uh, methanol solvent, right? So what's going to happen? Let's identify our adjacent hydrogens first. That's always a good place to start. We have two right here. And do we have any over here? No, right? That carbon doesn't have any hydrogens attached to it. So those are our only two options. So what's going to happen? Our base is going to come in. That's, that's ME, sorry. Negative formal charge. It's going to grab one of these hydrogens, deprotonate it, send those electrons into a carbon-carbon pi bond, and then goodbye leaving group. Okay, so what does our product look like? We still have our best friend benzene right here. And now we have this. We have a new carbon-carbon pi bond right there. Okay, hope that's clear. That's a basic E2 uh, reaction mechanism. And now let's go into some of the details. So one thing I, I hope you noticed when I did that mechanism is that everything happened at once in one step. The leaving group left, the deprotonation of the hydrogen, and the formation of the carbon-carbon pi bond were all one step. And that's what we mean when we say that it's concerted. E2 is concerted just like SN2 is concerted. Everything happens in one step. When we say it's bimolecular, and that's what the two is for, by the way, uh, we're saying that the rate of the reaction depends on two things. It depends on the concentration of the base and the concentration of the substrate. Um, so that's what we mean when we say it's bimolecular. Remember, SN2, just like E2, is also bimolecular. Okay, so we're good with that. Zaitsev's rule applies to E2 just like it does for E1. I talked about it a lot in the E1 video, but just a quick review. Zaitsev's rule says that the most substituted alkene is favored. So mono substituted is less favorable than a di substituted, which is less favorable than a tri, which is less favorable than a tetra substituted alkene. Okay, so that's Zaitsev's rule. Uh, strong base. This is a really important point. Every E2 mechanism requires a strong base. Just like SN2 requires a strong nucleophile, E2 requires a strong base. And those aren't the same thing. We'll talk about that later. Not every strong nucleophile is a strong base. and Not every strong base is a strong nucleophile. So just for now, uh, keep in mind that you need a strong base, which is why, by the way, I chose uh, methoxide for that example. It's a very strong base. Okay, now we come to the point of periplanar. So this is a concept that typically really intimidates OCHEM students. I know I was frightened when I saw it and when we were learning it, so I'm hoping to make that a little clearer, or a lot clearer. Periplanar means same plane. Anti-periplanar means same plane, but anti to each other, right? Same plane, but pointing in opposite directions to minimize steric hindrance. So what does this concept really, what's it really getting at? It's basically saying that the hydrogen 
we want to deprotonate. I'm going to be lazy and just use a bunch of abbreviations. The hydrogen that we want to deprotonate must be in the same plane as the leaving group and preferably, I'm just going to write pref, and preferably anti to the leaving group. Okay, so we want the hydrogen in the same plane and preferably pointing in, a, in the opposite direction. So those are just words and words can sometimes not be enough in OCHEM, you want an example. So that's what I'm gonna give you guys. So let's take a look at an example. Okay, so here's a molecule that I've drawn. Uh, and we're gonna use this as a guide to understanding what anti-periplanar really means. So I'm not gonna put this in any reaction. We're just gonna say that this is the substrate for an E2 reaction. And let's take a look at the spatial relationships, okay? First things first, what's our leaving group? It's this guy right here, the bromine, that's our leaving group. Now, what are our options for hydrogens that we could deprotonate if we were to hypothetically put this in an E2? There's only one, it's this one, right? You can't take this one. This one is on the carbon that's losing the leaving group. You need adjacent hydrogens. So this is the hydrogen we want to deprotonate. This is the leaving group. Antiperiplanar says that this better be in the same plane as this, but pointing in opposite directions. Some of you might be able to tell right off the bat that they're in different planes because the bromine is in the plane of the board and hydrogen is pointing into the board. But even if you can't see that, which is totally fine, I'm gonna show you a tool to use and that tool is called the Newen projection. I cringe when I hear that. I cringed when I heard that in OCHEM, but it, it really does help. So now what we're gonna do is this, okay? Pretend that this is your eye and you're looking down at the molecule this way. Let's call this carbon one and carbon two. Let's say you're looking dead on at carbon one. It's like in your face and carbon two is behind you, is behind it, sorry. So the best piece of advice that I was ever given or the best method for drawing Lewis uh, Newman projections um, is the following. Notice how the methyl is pointing out at you and the hydrogen is into the board. That means that if this were a 3D mo uh, model, like, like that you could build with your model kit, I can grab that methyl right here with my left hand because it's pointing out. The hydrogen is pointing into the board, so I'd have to reach over here. So here's the hydrogen, here's the methyl. Now I'm holding the molecule kind of by the horns, if you will. I'm gonna turn it just like this and look straight at it. So the methyl is still in my left hand, the hydrogen is still in my right hand. How does that translate onto a Newman projection? Well, easy, right? The methyl was in my left hand, the hydrogen was in my right hand, and what's above is bromine, right? VR. Okay, perfect. And we can apply the exact same rule, right? Doing this, you kind of look like an idiot, but it's fine. So uh, the, ba the back carbon, carbon number two, is represented by a big circle, just like this. And we can apply the exact same rule. Turn it this way, you're holding the ethyl here. Your hydrogen will be right here, and your phenyl is down here. Perfect. So, this was our leaving group right here. And where's the hydrogen that we want to deprotonate? It's right here. It's this guy, right? It's not this hydrogen. This hydrogen and the bromine are on the same carbon. It's this hydrogen. So, are these anti periplanar? The answer is no. Are they anti to each other? Of course not, right? Right now, the bromine is anti to the phenyl. The methyl is anti to the hydrogen. The hydrogen is anti to the ethyl. So we want to bring this hydrogen down here. So what our new Newman projection would look like if we made it anti-periplanar is this, right? Let's keep the front the same. So we'd still have Br and then a methyl and a hydrogen, but now What's this gonna look like? Our hydrogen is over here. And since we rotated it this much, the phenyl will be over here. And finally, the ethyl will be over here. Now, take a look. The bromine is here, the hydrogen is here. They are anti periplanar to each other. So how do we get from this to the product, right? I don't even need to give you 
um, what the base was. I'm just going to say, let's say we react this with a strong base. How can we get what the product looks like just from this? Here's a trick. What two things do you lose in an E2 mechanism? You lose the hydrogen and you lose the leaving group. So let's just erase those two, right? You lose the hydrogen and you lose the leaving group. This is our new Newman projection for the product. So really just using an eraser, we converted a reactant Newman projection to a product Newman projection. So you can interpret what the product's gonna look like just from here. Watch this. We know that the phenyl and the ethyl are on the same carbon, methyl and hydrogen are on the same, are on the same carbon. But what about their spatial arrangement? Here's what I mean by that. We have our double bond, of course, which would be right here. We know that our phenyl and our, and our methyl are on different carbons, but close to each other. So that's how we know to draw it like this. And similarly, our ethyl and our hydrogen are on two different carbons, but they're close to each other. The ethyl is on the same carbon as the phenyl. And the hydrogen goes here. So that's the product. It's a lot of work, but you will get the hang of it real quick. Okay, so that's how we go from this to a new one projection back to the product. Okay. Okay, a couple more things to talk about. Some good nucleophiles, sorry. Um, yeah, some good nucleophiles are bad bases. So what do we mean by that? Let's look at the halogens, for instance. If you get something like I minus or Br minus, right, Cl minus, those, um, they're good nucleophiles, full negative charge. We use them all the time in SN2, but they are bad bases, and so can they can't undergo E2. So if your teacher tries to trick you and puts, you know, I minus or NaCl um, as a reactant, E2 won't happen. SN2 could, E2 can't. So that's what we mean when we say some good nucleophiles are bad bases. Similarly, some bad nucleophiles are good bases, and the one a uh, really important molecule that you typically learn in OCHEM class is called tert butoxide. It looks something like this. That's, sorry, that's a negative formal charge. And this is a tert butyl group right here. So this is tert butoxide, and it'll become your best friend uh, when it comes to synthesis, but we'll get into that later. For now, just know that this is only a base and not a nucleophile. And that's because of this group right here. This group is so bulky that it hinders its nucleophilicity a lot. But does it hinder the basicity? No, it's an extremely strong base. So this will undergo E2, but not SN2. The halogens in their ionized form will undergo e, uh, SN2, but not E2. So that's E2 in a nutshell. I really hope uh, that you gained something from that. And thanks for watching.